Yes, Ms. Orr. Commissioner, the next case studies concern the conduct of two insurance companies, UE and AAI, in handling claims under home insurance policies following natural disasters and severe weather events. Before we turn to those case studies, we want to provide some context about the issues that arise in connection with the handling of claims following natural disasters and severe weather events. Natural disasters have devastating, long-lasting financial effects on the individuals and communities affected by them. The Insurance Council of Australia has estimated that over the past two decades, insurance losses arising from natural disasters and severe weather events that it has declared to be catastrophes totaled approximately $25 billion. In addition to their financial effects, natural disasters and severe weather events also have a significant social impact. This can include mental health issues, the breakdown of relationships, short and long-term unemployment and community dislocation. It has been estimated that the social impacts of natural disasters may be equal to or greater than the financial impacts caused by these events. When a natural disaster occurs, individuals and communities rely on insurance companies to help them rebuild and recover. In the wake of each of tropical cyclones Yazi in 2011 and Debbie in 2017, the value of insurance claims exceeded $1.5 billion. The value of insurance claims following the widespread flooding in Queensland in 2010 and 2011 was approximately $2.4 billion. There are several types of insurance policies under which a person might make a claim following a natural disaster or severe weather event. These include home and contents policies, business interruption policies, liability insurance policies, life insurance policies and health insurance policies. The focus of these case studies will be on home insurance policies. Interesting to know who's printing what, Ms Orr, but there we are. Not me, Commissioner. <laughs> Before we turn to the case studies, we want to say something briefly about the issue of the definition of flood in home insurance policies which received considerable attention following a series of natural disasters that occurred throughout Australia in 2010 and 2011. Between December 2010 and January 2011, large areas of Queensland experienced prolonged and extensive rainfall, leading to historic flooding. In February 2011, Cyclone Yazi made landfall in northern Queensland as a Category 5 cyclone, causing further extensive damage. More than 78% of Queensland was declared a disaster zone, with over 2.5 million people affected and 29,000 homes and businesses suffering inundation. Six months after Cyclone Yazi, approximately 64% of insurance claims arising from the event remained open. 12 months later, approximately 24% of claims still remained open. In 2010 and 2011, parts of Western Australia, New South Wales and Victoria also experienced extreme weather events, including floods and hailstorms. Several inquiries were commissioned to report on the 2010 and 2011 natural disasters and on the perceived shortcomings of the insurance industry in responding to those events. Among other things, those inquiries found that many insurance policies did not provide cover for damage caused by flood, definitions of flood in policies varied and were generally complicated, and many people did not realise that their policies excluded flood from cover. The inquiries also identified areas of concern in relation to the timeliness of the resolution of insurance claims and complaints about the handling of insurance claims and the lack of effective communication about the progress of claims. Two of the entities that provided submissions to the Commission earlier this year addressed these issues in their submissions. 
CBA acknowledged that it had engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations in relation to its handling of insurance claims arising from natural disasters. CBA told the Commission that the product disclosure statement for its home and contents insurance policies from 2007 to 2013 excluded flood coverage, but did have limited flash flooding coverage. CBA acknowledged that the complexity and difficulty in determining if damage was caused by a flood or by flash flooding, as defined in the PDS, gave rise to considerable customer confusion, ambiguity and delay in the resolution of claims. At the time of the Queensland floods in 2010 and 2011, the PDS contained a general exclusion for flood coverage. In the case of flash flooding, the PDS covered up to 15% of the total sum insured for the building and 25% of the sum insured for contents. A number of claims were ultimately denied. Alliance said that before the 2011 Queensland floods, most residential home insurance policies in Australia excluded cover for riverine flood. As a result, Alliance denied many thousands of flood claims, causing great dissatisfaction among impacted policyholders and in the broader community. Alliance told the Commission that it introduced flood cover in 2012, but allows customers to opt out of flood cover. It said that flood risk can increase premiums on flood exposed homes by up to 2,000%. <coughs> Due to the high cost of cover, Alliance said that most homeowners with medium to high flood risks opt out of flood cover. As a result, flood is excluded and flood claims will generally be denied. Allianz noted that this was most recently highlighted in the 2017 northern New South Wales flooding generated by Cyclone Debbie. Allianz said that any community expectations that homeowners suffering losses from flood damage will be covered by insurance will generally remain unmet. In April 2012, following the inquiries into the events of 2010 and 2011, the Insurance <laughs> Contracts Amendment Act of 2012 was passed. It amended the Insurance Contracts Act to provide a framework for making regulations for a standard definition of flood in home building and home contents insurance contracts, and to require the provision of a key facts sheet with home building and home contents policies, which outlines information about the policy in a concise form. The Insurance Council of Australia told the Commission that the deployment of standard flood cover in many policies facilitated quicker outcomes for many policyholders following the New South Wales Hunter Valley floods in April 2015. The Commission sought witness statements from representatives of Legal Aid New South Wales and Legal Aid Queensland about the assistance that they provide to people who have been affected by natural disasters and severe weather events and common issues arising from the conduct of insurance companies in responding to those events. The Commission received a statement from Mr Paul Holmes, a senior lawyer with Legal Aid Queensland. Mr Holmes said that Legal Aid Queensland has provided people with assistance following a number of natural disasters or severe weather events, including the Queensland floods in 2010 and 2011, Cyclone Yazi in February 2011 and associated flood events in Western Queensland, floods affecting Bundaberg and Maryborough in January 2013, major storm events throughout Queensland, Cyclone Marsha in February 2015 and Cyclone Debbie in March and April 2017. Mr Holmes said that following Cyclone Yasi and the Queensland floods that occurred in 2010 and 11, the key issues affecting people making insurance claims were confusion about the scope of insurance coverage that they held, including the different definitions of flood that existed between different insurers. A poor and impersonal initial claims experience 
which did not build trust or rapport between the claimant and the company, and insurance documents being complex and difficult to comprehend, leading to people not understanding the extent of their coverage. As we've mentioned, following those events, a standard definition of flood was introduced. While Mr Holmes believed that this had a positive effect for consumers, he told the Commission that the downside for people in Queensland is that flood insurance is now very expensive in many areas. Mr Holmes told the Commission about four common issues that currently affect the insurance claims process for people following natural disasters. First, he said that some claims assessors or claims managers provide claimants with the wrong information about the chances of success with their claim, their likely insurance payment and the claims process. This can cause great stress to people. Second, Mr Holmes told the Commission that disputes about the scope of works to be performed by repairers are common. These often involve disagreement about the extent or cost of a scope of works and the proposal to fix the damage. Mr Holmes said that disputing a scope of works can be expensive for customers who are often required to pay for their own building reports or assessments. Third, Mr Holmes referred to occasions where insurers offered inappropriate cash settlements that either did not reflect the amount it would cost an insured person to repair the damage or were made by the insurer in an attempt to get a dispute off their books when there had been ongoing problems regarding repairs. Finally, Mr Holmes raised the issue of claims being denied on the basis that a property had not been maintained to an appropriate standard. Mr Holmes told the Commission that problems arise because different definitions and interpretations of the word maintenance are used by different insurers in their policies. Commissioner, I tender the witness statement of Paul Holmes dated the 11th of June 2018. That statement becomes Exhibit 6.317. The Commission also received a statement from Ms Brenda Staggs, a senior solicitor at Legal Aid New South Wales. Ms Staggs is also the current consumer representative <coughs> on the General Insurance Code Governance Committee. Ms Staggs told the Commission that Legal Aid New South Wales has been involved in assisting clients with legal needs following natural disasters since 2008. Two of the main areas in which solicitors from Legal Aid New South Wales provide assistance following natural disasters are advising in relation to insurance claims and advising of rights in relation to financial hardship. Ms Staggs told the Commission that the last four major disasters where Legal Aid New South Wales attended a disaster recovery centre were the 2013 bushfires in the Blue Mountains, the 2015 Hunter Dugong floods, the 2017 North Coast floods, which occurred when Tropical Cyclone Debbie moved to the south and merged with a cold front in northern New South Wales, and the 2018 bushfires near Tathra, in which 69 houses were destroyed, 30 mobile homes were lost, and 39 houses were damaged. Following the Blue Mountains bushfires, Legal Aid New South Wales conducted a survey of 120 clients to whom they provided legal advice or assistance. Legal Aid identified the following main issues arising from the survey responses and their work following the fires. First, Ms Staggs told the Commission that the issue of underinsurance, where a property is insured for less than it is worth, arose generally in the casework of Legal Aid New South Wales. Ms Staggs gave an example of a client who was a long-term customer of her insurance company and who had spoken to the company numerous times about the sum of her building insurance cover and her premiums. Shortly after the Blue Mountains bushfires, which destroyed her home and contents, an assessor told her that she was grossly underinsured. The client said that had she been told that she was underinsured, she would have immediately insured her home for the recommended amount. 
the client rebuilt her home from her life savings and remains more than $220,000 out of pocket. Second, Ms Stagg said that Legal Aid New South Wales witnessed several instances of insurance companies not adopting a more trauma-informed approach to claims management. Ms Stagg said that Legal Aid New South Wales had observed that clients who had lost everything in the Blue Mountains um, were asked to make a detailed list of all the contents they had lost which was re-traumatising to them and was likely to result in an underestimation of their loss. Ms Staggs provided an example of an eight-year-old boy whose family lost their home and all of its contents in the bushfires. The boy was asked by the insurer to make a list of all the toys that he had lost. Ms Staggs told the Commission that Legal Aid New South Wales and other agencies have designed a total loss protocol, proposing that when a policyholder has lost everything and they are insured for a reasonable amount, the contents claim should be paid immediately and in full without the need for the policyholder to make an itemised list of contents. Most insurers agree to adhere to the principles of the protocol during a natural disaster. Legal Aid New South Wales has made submissions to the Insurance Council of Australia about the desirability of the total loss protocol being included in the next version of the General Insurance Code of Practice. Commissioner, I tender the witness statement of Brenda Staggs, dated the 11th of September 2018. That statement becomes Exhibit 6.318. We turn now to the particular case studies through which we will examine the conduct of insurers in the handling of insurance claims following natural disasters. These case studies relate to four natural disasters or severe weather events that have occurred in the last four years. The first of the case studies relates to the conduct of UI in connection with two insurance claims, one arising from damage to a home caused by tropical cyclone Debbie and the other arising from damage to a home caused by a hailstorm in Broken Hill. We'll say something further about each of those events. In March 2017, Tropical Cyclone Debbie, which was classified as a Category 4 cyclone, made landfall at the Queensland northeast of Airlie Beach. The cyclone travelled southwards, causing damage and flooding in southeast Queensland and northern rivers. Approximately 2,300 homes were damaged and there were 14 fatalities. The Insurance Council of Australia told the Commission that Cyclone Debbie is the second most expensive cyclone in Australia's history after Cyclone Tracy, which hit Darwin on Christmas Day in 1974. Tropical Cyclone Debbie saw more than 75,000 insurance claims lodged for an estimated insurance insured value of $1.77 billion. We spoke with people who made a number of claims under home insurance policies following Tropical Cyclone Debbie. We sought statements from five insurance companies, AAI, Allianz, Cominsure, Westpac and UI, about their handling of claims arising both from natural disasters since the 1st of January 2013 and specifically from Cyclone Debbie. AAI told the Commission that over this five year period, it had received almost 90,000 claims under home or contents policies arising from natural disasters. It also told the Commission that as at the 30th of April this year, it had received 8,719 claims under home or contents policies arising from tropical cyclone Debbie. Allianz told the Commission that over this five year period, it had received more than 30,000 claims under home or contents policies arising from natural disasters and it had received more than 2,900 claims arising from Tropical Cyclone Debbie. Cominsure told the Commission that over the five year period, it had received almost 40,000 claims under home or contents policies arising from events that it classified as natural disasters. 
as at the 17th of May this year, it had received more than 3,400 claims under home or contents policies arising from tropical cyclone Debbie. Westpac told the Commission that as at June this year, it had received 2,872 claims arising from tropical cyclone Debbie. UWE told the Commission that over the five-year period it had received more than 13,000 claims under home or contents policies arising from events that it classified as natural disasters. As at the 20th of June this year, it had received over 2,000 claims under home or contents policies arising from tropical cyclone Debbie. The Insurance Council of Australia told the Commission that six months after Cyclone Debbie, approximately 42% of claims remained open. Twelve months later, approximately 17% of claims still remained open. The Commission will hear evidence in connection with Tropical Cyclone Debbie from Mr Glenn Sutton, who made a claim with UWE following the cyclone. In November 2016, a severe hailstorm struck parts of South Australia, Victoria and New South Wales, including the town of Broken Hill. This event resulted in extensive property damage in the town, particularly to the roofs of the properties there. The Insurance Council told the Commission that the storm brought hail the size of golf balls, strong winds with gusts of almost 100 kilometres an hour and heavy rain. Approximately 52,000 insurance claims were lodged as a result of the storm for an insured loss estimated at $597 million. Six months after the hailstorm, approximately 53% of claims remained open and 12 months later, approximately 6% of claims remained open. The Commission will hear evidence from Ms Sasha Murphy, who made a claim with UWE following the storm. In both these case studies, Mr Jason Storey of UWE will give evidence about the claims. The second of the case studies relates to the conduct of AAI, which trades as Suncorp Insurance, in advertising its home insurance policies and in handling claims under those policies. That conduct came to light as part of an investigation into Suncorp's handling of insurance claims arising from the bushfires near Wye River in Victoria in 2015. On Christmas Day in 2015, a bushfire in the Wye River region of Victoria broke containment lines and spread rapidly. Over 240 buildings in the area were affected, including 116 which were destroyed. The Insurance Council of Australia told the Commission that over 511 claims were lodged following this bushfire for an estimated insured value of $110 million. Six months after the bushfire, approximately 64% of claims remained open and 12 months later, approximately 35% of claims remained open. In this case study, the Commission will hear evidence from Mr Gary Dransfield, the Chief Executive Officer Insurance for the Suncorp Group. The third of the case studies relates to the conduct of AAI in handling an insurance claim arising from damage to a home caused by flood. In April 2015, an intense east coast low pressure system caused storm and flood damage along the eastern seaboard, including the Hunter Valley. This event resulted in extensive damage to homes, stock and infrastructure, with approximately 4,500 calls made to the SES. Power and water access was restricted for tens of thousands of homes across the wider Hunter region. At least four people died. The Insurance Council of Australia told the Commission that more than 135,280 insurance claims were lodged as a result of the event for an insured value of approximately $949 million. In this case study, the Commission will hear evidence from Ms Bernadette Heald, who made a claim following the floods with uh, AAI, and from Mr Gary Dransfield, again the Chief Executive Officer Insurance for the Suncorp Group. Commissioner, I tender a number of statements received from the different insurers. 
in relation to Allianz, I tender the witness statement of David Kreutz, dated the 13th of June 2018. Comes exhibit 6.319. A further witness statement of David Kreutz, dated the 25th of June 2018. Exhibit 6.320. And the witness statement of Laurie Callahan dated the 13th of June 2018. Exhibit 6.321. In relation to CBA, I tender the witness statement of Helen Troop dated the 12th of June 2018. Exhibit 6.322. Two. A second statement. Um, from Helen Troop, also dated the 12th of June 2018. Exhibit 6.323. And a supplementary witness statement from Ms Troop, dated the 22nd of June 2018. Exhibit 6.324. In relation to Suncorp, I tender the witness statement of Gary Dransfield, dated the 13th of June 2018. Exhibit 6.325. In relation to Westpac, I tender the witness statement of Susan Horton, dated the 22nd of June 2018. Exhibit 6.326. In relation to UE, I tender the witness statement of Bert Backer, dated the 8th of June 2018. Exhibit 6.327. And the supplementary witness statement of Bert Backer dated the 21st of June 2018. Exhibit 6.328. Commissioner, I now call Ms Sasha Murphy. Yes, Ms Murphy, could I ask you to come into the witness box and just stay standing for a moment uh, while I ask you first whether you'd prefer to make an oath or take an affirmation? <laughs> I'll take an affirmation. Yes, affirm the witness, please. I solemnly and sincerely. I solemnly and sincerely. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Do sit down. Yes, Ms. Orr. Ms. Murphy, could you please state your full name? Sasha Michelle Murphy. And you live at an address in Broken Hill uh, that's known to the Commission? Yes. Uh, what is your occupation, Ms Murphy? I'm an Asset Data Administrator. And did you receive a summons from the Commission to attend and give evidence today? Yes. Do you have that summons there? Yes. I attend to that summons, Commissioner. The summons to Ms Murphy exhibits 6.329. And Ms Murphy, did you make a witness state for the Commission dated the 20th of June 2018? Yes, I did. Are, are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes. I tender that statement, Commissioner. Exhibit 6.330. Now, Ms Murphy, you said that you live in Broken Hill. Can you explain how far Broken Hill is from the nearest city? Um, it's three hours away from the nearest city, which is Mildura. And how long have you lived in Broken Hill, Ms Murphy? I have lived in Broken Hill for 16 years. And can you tell us a bit about the climate in Broken Hill? Um, it's hot and arid. And you live in Broken Hill with your partner and your children? Yes. How many children do you have, Ms Murphy? I have four children. And how old are your children? Eight, six, two and six months. Thank you. Now, how long have you lived in your house in Broken Hill, Ms Murphy? Um, since November 2009. Do you know when your house was built? Oh, a very long time ago. Yeah. And can you tell us a bit about your house? Um, it's a small three-bedroom home. Um, yeah, it's tiny. I'm sorry, it's... It's tiny. Tiny, yeah. Now, uh, Ms Murphy, there are two mines in Broken Hill, is that right? Yep. Uh, and are there issues with lead contamination in Broken Hill? Yes, there are. Can you tell us about those issues? Um, so the lead comes off the mine and the iron ore dump sites um, and is blown around. It's The lead particles are in the air and they settle on any surface be it a roof, a ground, 
um, playground equipment, whatever. Are the lead levels of children in the Broken Hill community monitored? Yes, they are, yep. And how often are those lead levels monitored for children who live in the community? Um, children under five are monitored every year. Um, if they go over a certain um, level, they're monitored more frequently. That can be six months or three months. And why is that done, Ms Murphy? Um, uh, lead is dangerous for children. And what happens if a child's lead levels test higher than the prescribed level? Um, well, they're tested more regularly. Um, and in our case, um, they came out to our house um, and done lead testing with the soil. So um, one or more of your children have tested above the prescribed lead levels? Um, two have, yes. Uh, and you said after that, uh, people came out to your house to do what? <coughs> They um, tested the levels of lead in our soil, mm. in our backyard, front yard. Now, I want to come back to when that happened with you a little later, yep. but could you tell us uh, first about the Lead Smart initiative in Broken Hill? Yeah, so um, they predominantly um, provide education to parents um, and even workers on the mine and different industries um, how to um, how to avoid lead in the home and um, so it can't affect children, mm. etc. And the Lead Smart initiative has a partnership with the EPA, is that right? The yes. Environment Protection Authority? Yes. Uh, and do people who represent that initiative come and uh, test lead levels in the soil at people's homes when necessary? Yes. Now, do they then conduct remediation work when the lead levels in the soil are higher than prescribed levels? Yeah. And what sort of remediation work do they do? Um, well, they, they dig up the soil, um, about 10 centimetres of it, and replace it with loam. Now, uh, Ms Murphy, you have a home and contents insurance policy with UE. Yep. And do you remember when you took that out? Um, Probably about 2012, I believe. And in 2016, did you also have a car insurance policy with UE? Yes. yes. Now, I want to take you back to November 2016. Uh, in November 2016, there was a hailstorm in Broken Hill. Yep. Can you tell us a bit about the hailstorm? Um, it came in really fast um, and it was quite ferocious and I, I believe it came in from the west and yeah there was hail coming down really fast i i stood in the kids bedroom with my children and we we watched it pelt our car um but we we certainly weren't going to go outside because it was dangerous so we just stood there and watched it and how long did it last it didn't last very long um probably five minutes tops and had you ever seen a hailstorm like that in Broken Hill before then? I've never seen hail in Broken Hill. Have you seen anything like that since? No. no. Uh, now, the hail you said was pelting on your car. Did yep. it damage your car? Yes, my car looked like a golf ball after it had finished. Uh, and did the hail damage your house? Um, it wasn't evident at first, but later on it became evident. Mm -hmm. And how did it become evident? Um, we asked that um, UE send some people out to have a look at it um, and they said that there was hail damage. And where was the damage? Was it to the roof? Yes, it was to the roof um, of our house, our shed and our cubby house. Okay. Now, after the storm, did you contact UE to make a claim under your car insurance policy? Yes. And in the course of making that claim under your car insurance policy, did you also tell them about um, your fear that there was damage to the house? Yes, yeah. Uh, and then you made a claim under your home insurance policy. You tell us in your statement in late 2016 or early 2017. Yes. And after you made that claim, did an assessor from UE come to your house to assess the damage? Yes. And did some builders come with the assessor? They came separately to the assessor. Mm -hmm. And did you have any discussions firstly with the assessor about the state of your roof? Yes. What did you say to him? 
Um, I discussed it with the assessor and the builders. I said I had concerns that there were some structural issues there that became evident earlier when um, some solar panels were erected on my roof. Some pre-existing structural issues with the roof? Yes. And what did the assessor say to you in response to that? Uh, he said that it would be brought to code. Uh, and did you understand that to be a reference to the building code? Yes. Uh, and did you understand that you were going to need to pay any extra for that to occur? No. I... Uh, and did you have any discussions to similar effect with the builders? Yep. They said that they generally allow um, extra for that sort of stuff. They allow extra for that sort of stuff. So again, did you understand that you were going to have to pay anything extra because of that? Yes, I, I assume that we weren't going to have to pay. Um, and did anyone tell you uh, that you would need to pay any money other than the excess for the repairs to be done? Yeah, no one told me that. Okay. Um, now, after the assessor and the builders came to your house, you were sent two scopes of work from two different builders, is that right? Yep, that's correct. And did they include a price, a quote for the repair work? No, there was no price on the scope of works. And was the scope of the works to be done similar in each of the two documents? Yes, they were pretty much identical. Uh, and did Yui suggest to you that you should go with one of the scope of works over the other? Uh, yes, they suggested to my partner, Darren. Now, I, I'm going to refer to the builder whose scope of works Yui suggested you go with as the builder from here on in, because uh, the builder's name is the subject of a non-publication direction. Yep. Um, now, did you contact the builder uh, to ask some questions about the scope of works? Yes, I'd done that several times. And how did you go with that? Um, they, the lady I spoke to wouldn't answer my question. Um, she said they would call me back and they never called me back. And how many times do you think you contacted the builder to try and get your questions about the scope of works answered? Um, I, I called them several times um, before they came to our house. Uh, and did you have particular concerns about the scope of works? Yes. What were those concerns? Um, I wanted to assure that the structural issues were included in the scope of works. Um, there were some words in the scope of works that led me to believe that part of it was included. And you wanted to confirm that the structural works were covered by yes. the scope of works? Yes, that's what I wanted. And were you able to do that? No, they, they wouldn't discuss that with me. Okay. Um, now, did you decide to proceed with the scope of works from the builder anyway? Yes. And why did you make that decision? Um, Darren thought that me calling them all the time was delaying our um, construction date. Darren's your partner? Yes. 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 Uh, so you were concerned about the delay that was being caused as a result of your attempts to get further information about the scope of works? Yes, I thought that might have been a factor as to why it was being delayed. Did you then need some time to get together the excess payment under your uh, home insurance policy and under your car insurance policy? Yep, it took us um, yeah, three or four months to save up that money. I had to work extra shifts at work to get that. Uh, now, around this time, um, your children's lead levels were tested, is that right? Uh, yes, my daughter was being tested because she was under five. Yeah. And did your daughter test above the prescribed amount of lead? Yes. And as a result of that, did Lead Smart come out to your home to test the lead levels in your backyard? Yes. Uh, now, you tell us in your statement that they had to test the levels on two occasions within a couple of weeks. Yes. And the lead levels in your backyard, you tell us, were found to be very high. Yes, they were. Yep. And what did the EPA and the Lead Smart Initiative tell you needed to be done as a result of those high lead levels? And they told me that the ground would have to be dug up and replaced with loam. Mm -hmm. And could they do that right away? No, they couldn't because they said that when the roof was taken off, um, the dust in the roof cavity would recontaminate the site. So the works to deal with the lead contamination in your backyard could not be done until the roof was fixed? Yes. 
Um, were you and your children able to spend time in the backyard after you were told that the soil was contaminated with lead? No, it was advised that we didn't allow them to play out the back. Uh, so did you want the repairs to your roof to be completed quickly? Yes, as and quick as possible. Yes. And did you tell the builder that? Yes, several and, times. Yeah. And did you tell the builder why you wanted the works to be done quickly? Yes, I thought telling them that would make them go faster. Now, at this point, although you'd approved the scope of works uh, and paid the excess, the repair works hadn't commenced? Is yes. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. And did you call the builder and try and get a start date for the works? Yeah. How many times did you call them to try and get a start date for the works? Yes, um, at least three or four, yeah, from that point, yeah. And when you told the builder that you wanted the repair works to be done quickly because they were delaying the lead remediation work. Did that speed things up? No, it didn't appear to, no. Um, you say in your statement that the builders pushed back the start date a number of times. Yeah, they did, yeah. And how did that affect you and your family? Um, it was very frustrating, yeah. Uh, so you'd put in a claim um, either at the end of the previous year or the start of this year uh, and you'd paid your excess within a few months after that, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Now, when did the builder come and start the work on your property? Um, I believe it was um, early October or end of September. And can you tell us what happened when the builder came out to your property to start the works in October? Um, so they came to our property and started pulling the roof off and then they um, come in at the end of the day and said that they weren't going to do any more, that the structural issues were too much for them and they hadn't had enough money to um, deal with the structural issues. So on that day, did they remove part of your roof? Yes. Uh, did they remove the air conditioner from the roof? Yes, and the solar panels and the exhaust for the bathroom. And did they leave the air conditioning vent that went into the house open to the elements? Yes. Uh, now, how did you try after that to keep the house cool without the air conditioner? We had to open our windows and doors, which was not ideal because that meant that um, more lead dust was getting in the house. Um, now, you tell us in your statement that you stood at the top of the cubby house in the backyard to see what the state of the roof was after they left that day. What, what did you see? Um, only one bedroom was covered. Essentially, all the other um, roofing iron had been taken off. Now, um, after they took that part of the roof off uh, and left that day, um, had they told you how much money they wanted before they could come back and complete the works? They wanted um, approximately $3,000 and they wanted um, half of that in their bank account before they would come back. And you told us before that it took you some months to pull the excess together, doing yes. extra shifts, Ms Murphy. The excess under your home insurance policy was $775? Yeah. And was it approximately the same for the car insurance policy? Yeah, a little bit more for the car, I believe, yeah. Okay. Now, you've exhibited to your statement copies of the documents that the builders sent to you and your partner um, after they were there at your house that day. Yep. If we go to exhibit one to your statement, which is RCD 0024 0020 0001, Yep. That will come up on the screen as well, Ms Murphy. And we see at the... We'll just need to take that down, Commissioner. I see that redactions that ought to be in place are not in place. Um, you have a copy of that document there in front of you, um, Ms Murphy. You can see that there is an email at the bottom of the page dated the 4th of October 2017. Yep. Um, which is sent by the repair coordinator at the builder, yep. which says, good afternoon, please find attached all relevant documents in regards to your private works. 
please sign and return the scope of works and pay your 50 per cent deposit. Once we have received these, we will be able to commence repairs. Do you see that? Yes. And um, the, if we turn to the second exhibit to your statement, no, I don't think I'd bring that up either. We're not going to be able to bring up the second exhibit? No, I would doubt it. At least not according to what I've got loaded here. All That's right. All. In that case, we won't bring it up and I'll ask you some questions about it because you have it in front of you, Ms Murphy. Yep. The second exhibit to your statement is the letter from the builder that was attached to the email. Is that right? Yes. Yep. And the letter said that the builder required the following items to be actioned prior to starting repairs. Yeah. And under that, we wish to advise that if you wish to proceed with the proposed works, a payment of 50% of the quoted amount is required prior to works commencing. Do you see that? Yes. Yep. And attached is a tax invoice for part payment. Yep. Exhibit three to your statement, which I'm nervous about asking to be brought up, is the invoice that was attached to the email as well. Yep. Um, I won't bring it up, Ms Murphy, but you have it in front of you and you can see that the invoice was for the sum of $3,675. Yes. Yep. With a 50% deposit of $1,837.50 required before commencement of works. Yes. Now, could you afford to pay the builder that money, Ms mm, Murphy? No. No. Um, with the builder having told you that they wouldn't come back unless you paid, and with parts of your roof off, what did you do? Um, we rang the insurance company. You rang UE that night? Yes. And you told them what had happened? Yes, yep. And your partner forwarded the email from the builder to UE? Yes. And what did they say? Um, they said not to pay it, that they would deal with it. Uh, now, did the builders come back the next day? No. And your roof remained off? Yes. And how did the roof being off affect you and your family? Um, it was scary. Um, we, we didn't know what would happen, what type of damage would be occurred, and my children were too scared to sleep in the house, essentially. They, um, they moved into the same bedroom and put their beds together. Um, and were you pregnant with your fourth child at I, this time, Ms Murphy? Yes. How pregnant were you at this point? Um, at that point, I would have been three or four months pregnant. Mm -hmm. And was the dust from the lead that was in your roof um, now exposed to the elements? Yes. And were you concerned about that lead dust coming into the house through the open air conditioning vent? Yes, it was, yep. Yeah. It was coming it into was the house? It was coming in, yeah. Uh, and were you concerned about the impact of that on your family and your unborn child? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, did you also start to become worried about what would happen if it rained? Yes, I certainly was, yeah. Uh, and did you call Yui and tell them um, uh, that you held concerns about what would happen if there was rain? Yes, I did. And uh, did you do that after you had been put on notice by a family member that rain looked to be coming to Broken yes. Hill? Yes, I did, yeah. Uh, and what did Yui tell you to do when you called them about that incoming rain? Um, they told us to call the builder, which I did. And what did the builder say to you? The builder said to me that he was watching the weather radar and if it looked like there was going to be rain, then he would come, whether it be at 2am in the morning, and put plastic over my roof. Did the builder arrange for someone to come out and cover the roof and protect it from the rain? No, they did not. Did anyone put a tarp on the roof for you? No. Did it rain? It sprinkled a little bit, um, but not heavy rain. And in the call that you had with Yui about the need to protect the roof from the rain, um, or in another call to Yui around this time, did you complain to them about how long it was taking for the roof to be repaired? Yes, I did. Did you tell Yui that you were pregnant? I did. 
and did you tell Yui that you were worried about you and your family being exposed to high levels of lead? Yes. Had you planned to have one of your children's birthday parties in the house that month? Uh, yes, we had planned to have his party. Yeah. And were house. you able to go ahead with the birthday party? No, no, we weren't. Now, about two weeks after the roof had been taken off, it was still off? Yes. And did you call Yui again? Yes. Uh, and did they tell you that the builder would be coming back to finish the job? They did, yes. And did the builder come back? Yes, they did come back two weeks later, yeah. Uh, and what happened that day when the builder came back? Um, so I was at work um, and they had arrived um, after I left for work. And when I got home, um, they brought Darren outside and they showed him some of the structural issues um, and they said that they were leaving and they weren't going to do it. They were leaving and they weren't going to do it? Yes. Uh, and what was the state that they'd left your house in? Um, it was a lot worse. They had taken um, what wood was in there and um, put it out the back in the laneway. They'd put what out the back in the laneway, sorry? Um, some of the wood that was holding the roof up. They'd taken that out? Yes. And put it in the laneway? Yes, but we, we didn't know that at that stage. Um, you say in your statement that they said that the construction issues were too big to tackle for the money they'd been given. Is yes. that right? Yes. And what about the inside of the house? Were there any um, effects on the inside of the house from the work that they did that day? Yes, they had put um, a couple of holes in the ceiling um, where they had fell, I guess. Um, and yeah, there was, there was dirt everywhere and leaves and all sorts. And how did you feel about all of that, Ms Murphy? I was very angry. I was very angry and stressed at and that point. did you telephone Yui again? Yes, yes, I called our assessor. Um, I was very angry at him and um, we, I just, yeah, let him have it basically. Did you feel that your house was habitable at that point as a result of the further works that they'd done that day? No, no, I was not going to stay in that house one more night. And uh, can you tell us a bit more about what it was like inside your house? You said that there was dirt everywhere. Yep, there was uh, dirt and leaves in my hallway, in my kitchen, um, in my bathroom. Um, and there was no air conditioner. It was in the mid to high 30s. I was pregnant. I had bad morning sickness and I just didn't want my kids in that house anymore. Did you ask Yui to arrange temporary accommodation for you and your family? Yes. Uh, and did you again tell them about the high lead levels in the backyard? Yes, yes, that was uh, discussed. And about your concerns that your children were being exposed to lead? Yes. Uh, and did you again tell them that the lead remediation works couldn't be done to the backyard until the roof was fixed? Yes. Did you mention that you had no air conditioning? Yes, I did. Uh, did you mention that you were needing to keep the windows open because of that and that more lead was coming in as a result? Yes, I did. Yeah. What was Yui's response to all of that? Um, they said that they hadn't known about the lead um, and they didn't know that the air conditioner had been taken off and we had been left um, with no air conditioner. Uh, did they agree to find you temporary accommodation? They did. Now, did you find the temporary accommodation or did they? Um, I found the temporary accommodation. Uh, now, you stayed in a cabin in a caravan park, is that right? Yes, that's right. For how many nights? Four nights. And were you then contacted by Yui? Yes, we were contacted and told that we could move back in because they had covered the roof and they had put um, the air conditioner back on. So they said they had covered the roof and put the air conditioner back on? Yes. And did you then move back into your house? Yes, we did. And what did you observe about the roof after you moved back in? Um, the temporary job that they had done was woeful. Um, they had... It looked like they had literally banged the sheets that they had taken off twice with a nail and they were flapping in the wind. Um, and our roof went from being flat 
too wavy. Um, you said it was flapping in the wind. Yes. Um, what were the consequences of that for you and your family? Um, well, it was scary. I, I wasn't sure if um, they were going to dislodge and hurt someone. Um, and yeah, I just, I was not very happy about the temporary roof that had been put back on. And how did you and your family cope with that new roof? Um, well, again, my, my children were scared and um, my eldest son refused to go in the bathroom at that stage. Um, I, when he did, when he had to go to the toilet, I had to be there and stand with him because he was too scared to be in there alone. Around this time, did you decide to contact the Financial Rights Legal Centre for some advice about what you could do? Yes, yes. And did the Financial Rights Legal Centre uh, give you some advice about lodging a complaint? Yes, they did. And did you then lodge a complaint uh, through UE's internal dispute resolution process? Yeah. And yeah. you say in your statement that you sent the complaint on the 30th of October 2017, yeah. but you sent it to the wrong email address. I, I did, yes. And you sent it again to the correct email address on the 2nd of November 2017? Yep. Yeah. Now, you've exhibited your complaint to your statement, um, which is Exhibit 4, um, which is um, YOU 0002 0001 0072. Uh, now, this is the complaint that you lodged with UE, yes, Ms Murphy. Is. Yes. And in your complaint, you raised a number of concerns with both the conduct of the builder and UE's handling of your claim. Yes. You told UE, among other things, that you'd been assured the repair works would be brought up to code. Yes, yes. Uh, that the information you'd told the builder about lead levels didn't seem to have been passed on to UE. Yes that you had no air conditioner and an exposed roof. Yeah. Uh, and the holes, the, you had holes and cracks in your ceilings which had not been repaired. Is yes, that right? Yes, that's right, yeah. Now, did you have any idea of how long it should take UE to deal with your complaint? Um, I was told by the woman at the Financial Services Centre that um, they would have to respond to me within 15 days. Okay. Now, on the 15th of November, after you'd lodged the complaint, but before you'd received a response, there was rain in Broken Hill? Yes, there was, yes. And um, what do you recall of that rain and the impact of that rain? Um, we weren't home when the rain event occurred, um, but when we did get home, um, it was evident that rain had come in in four rooms of our house. Um, the lounge room was particularly bad. Um, our, it had come through a skylight and had damaged our carpet and our lounge in the hallway. It had damaged the floor. Um, in our bathroom it was pooling um, and the kitchen, some had come through in the little holes near the back door um, and it wasn't evident at that time that it was pooling but over time it did begin to pull in the kitchen as well. Uh, you mentioned the skylight. Had the skylight been affected by the works that had been done by the builders? Um, yes, yes. Now, uh, did you and your partner call UE that night? Yes, we did. Uh, could you get on to the assessor that you had at UE? No, I, I don't think so. I think we just spoke to um, a customer representative. And did anyone come that night to help you with the water that was getting into the house? No. And what was the impact of this further damage to the inside of the house on you and your family? Um, oh, it was very frustrating. Um, we didn't have enough buckets. Um, we ended up using a, a baby bath to catch the water. Now, a day or two after that rain, did the builder come back and do some more work on the roof? Um, some other builders did. Another builder came? Yes. And did that other builder uh, put some plastic sheeting over the roof? 
um, one of the builders looked at putting plastic sheeting over the roof, but he said that there was um, not enough, like the, the bit that was not done correctly was too big. Um, and another company put some capping on, which had never been put back on. I see. Um, and after this, did you call UE to follow up on your complaint? Yes. Yes, we did. And what did they say to you? Um, they couldn't discuss it because it was um, in the complaints process. Now, you've annexed a written response from UE to your complaint, uh, which is Exhibit 5 to your statement. Uh, Y O U triple zero two triple zero one zero two one zero. We see that that letter from UE in response to your complaint is dated the twenty second of November two thousand and seventeen. When did you first see this, Ms Murphy? Um, I didn't see it for quite some time because it went in my junk email box. Um, so, yeah, it was quite later on that I'd seen it. Now, in January or February of this year, did another building company come out to the house? Yes. And did Yui give you another scope of works from that builder? They did, yes. And did that scope of works include fixing the internal damage to your house? Um, no, it, it wasn't sufficient to fix all of the internal damage. Did it include the damage to your bathroom? No. Now, after you got that scope of works from the other builder, uh, did Darren send an email to Yui uh, raising concerns with the coverage of the scope of works? Yes, he did. And you've annexed uh, that email to your statement as Exhibit 6, Y O U triple zero two triple zero two zero five five seven. Uh, so this is the email that your partner sent to Yui about the scope of works? Yes. And we see there that your partner listed a number of items of damage that were not dealt with in the scope of works. Yes. Did you or uh, your partner get a response to that email? Uh, yes, my partner um, got a response to that email. Um, they rang him and said that it would be fixed, but we had to sign that scope of works and they would fix the internal stuff later. Did you then sign the scope of works? Yes, we did. And when was your roof finally repaired? Um, oh, May this year? Yes, I can assist you with your statement if it helps. Um, in paragraph 49 of your statement, you say that the roof was permanently repaired on the 9th of May yes. this year. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it was repaired by the new builder? Yes. And how did you feel about the repairs? Um, we were pretty happy with the repairs. Um, a couple of issues came up um, and they're getting fixed soon. They're still getting fixed? Yes. Um, was the internal damage to the house repaired at the same time? No. Has the internal damage now been repaired? Uh, it's pretty much been repaired. There, a couple of issues came about um, with that um, repair job as well, which they're now fixing. So the internal damage repairs are not complete either? No. When do you understand that the repairs to your house will be finished? Um, in about... Um, six weeks, I think. Has the EPA and the Lead Smart Initiative been able to do the lead remediation work to your yard? No, not as yet. Why not? Um, they're still waiting for Yui to finish the repairs um, so they can come in and do their work. Uh, so have the continuing repair works delayed uh, the lead remediation works? Yes, they have, yep. Now, having now made it to the point where the damage to your house caused by the hailstorm in November 2016 has all but been repaired, and most but not all of the damage caused to your house 
during the events after the hailstorm has been repaired. What would you say about the way UWE handled your insurance claim? Um, it wasn't done very well. I felt like we constantly had to check everything. We had to stay on their case. Um, we had to really assert ourselves to get what we thought was the damage from the event. How would you sum up the impact of all of this on you and your family? Um, it's been very stressful. Um, we felt uh, powerless at times. Um, we really felt like we were butting our heads against a wall at times. How do you feel about the way UWE treated you and your partner as UWE policy holders during this experience? Um, not very well. Um, they have come to the par party recently and, and been a lot nicer and um, but yeah at, at the start we we were having lots of issues with them. And Ms Murphy why have you decided to share this story with the Royal Commission? Um, hopefully something can come about um, from this and they can learn from our case and hopefully it doesn't happen to another family. Thank you Ms Murphy. I have no further questions Commissioner. Thank you. No questions, Commissioner. Thank you very much, Ms Murphy. You may step down.